Last week, we spoke about traumas. Okay, participate with me, show of hands. How many of you guys got rolled by the enemy this week, man? He hit you where it hurt the most. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good. Ooh, and you dragged yourself back to church for more. That's the way we do it, man. That's the way we do it. Get up all bloody and you're like, you think you want any me? I'm still standing. You know? Ooh. Good. I just want you to know that if I'm feeling, if I seem low energy this morning, it's because I literally haven't had a wink of sleep all night. It was terrible. I've been up. This week has been mad crazy. The enemy is coming after me in so many different ways, all right? But I'm glad to tell you that I have a word from the Lord for you. No, no, no. I said, I got a word from the Lord for you. Thank you. I'm the one with no sleep, not you. So wake up and let's strengthen what remains and is about to die. Last week, we spoke about traumas. And don't be surprised when the enemy comes and tries to steal the word that God deposited in the good soil of your life. And many of you, you didn't recognize that the gospel sets you free from even these things that we experience in the reality of our life. You see, the problem with American Christianity is we lock Jesus up on the Sunday morning prison. That's it. Sunday morning church, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. And then you go back home to the same old, same old, fighting with your neighbors, getting angry with your spouse, worried about your finances, looking at what people think about you, and the gospel has lost its relevancy. Relevance. Pardon my Indian English. And then we wonder, why don't I feel the transformation that this pastor is talking about, that the Bible talks about? Why don't I experience this shift, this change from death to life? Last week, we spoke about those realities where the Holy Ghost begins to put the, his finger on the pulse of your life and he says, you're dying, wake up. You're carrying traumas from the past and you're bleeding yourself to death, wake up. And God is not wanting you to fall back to familiar patterns, we saw that. Whenever trauma triggers you, you run to familiar patterns, don't do that. Whenever there's triggers for your trauma, you embrace failures and identity, don't do that. Whenever there's triggers for your trauma, instead you press into favor. That's what we spoke, it's three things we spoke about. We spoke about the familiar, we spoke about the failure, and we spoke about favor. And hey, if you're struggling with traumas, I urge you, go listen to last week's sermon, take notes, and spend time in solitude applying it to your life because just listening is not going to change it. You got to apply it. Now, this week, we're taking it a step further, okay? So I want to warn you that there's going to be battle this week again for you, all right? But we sang last week, I'm going to see a victory. Why? Thank you. For the battle belongs to the Lord. So as we unpack these things, the enemy is not going to be happy. I just want you to know, the enemy is not going to be happy at all. Even right now, he's going to distract you. Even right now, he's going to say, bro, it's going to get hard. Just coast. No more coasting, Christian. We want to be victorious, all right? And today, what we're going to be talking about is how God is greater than your past. Many of you have been set free from your past. I've been set free from my past. Praise the Lord. Have you been set free from your past? Yes. yes. But isn't it crazy how the enemy will bring up your past again? He'll bring back past insecurities. He'll bring back past irritations. You're walking about, it's been 20, 30 years that God's healed you from the things from your past, and you see someone who reminds you of the past. I mean, and you're one foot in the grave already, and you're like, I can't wait to see Jesus, which is a good thing, by the way. I'm not insulting you. Sometimes I envy you. And all of a sudden, this rage from when you were 20 years old, from your first marriage, from what someone did to you when you were 13 years old, it all comes back. And you wonder if this is a, a, a baggage you're going to have to drag for the rest of your life. Now, not everything from your past is bad. Even though bad things might have happened to you, because we learn from our past mistakes, don't we? We have to. There are many, too many people who want to forget the past, and they forget even the lessons learned. And what do they do? They repeat the same old mistakes. 
they're in the fourth relationship and they're like, but this one's going to be different. I'm like, bro, have you forgotten what happened? Just last Valentine's Day. No, no, but this one. And no, it's not going to be different, man, because you haven't learned any lessons. You got to go back and remember those lessons that God taught you. God constantly kept telling, keeps telling Israel that they got to remember what happened, how God brought them to the wilderness, how God taught them, and every time they disobeyed, how God punished them, and all those different things. So we don't want to forget everything, but we don't want to be ruled by the past. Okay? Now, you might be sitting here and saying, but hey, listen, listen, listen. I really have no issues with my past. Jesus has set me free. There's no shame. There's no guilt. I've been set free in the name of Jesus. And I say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. That's awesome, man. Really. I celebrate that with you, okay? However... The tactics of the enemy is at some point in your life, he's going to hold a rearview mirror before you. And you got to remember more than just the verse that says in Philippians, you know, forgetting what was behind, I press on forward towards the upward call in Christ Jesus. You also have to know how do I press forward? How do I forget what's behind? How do I walk towards the destiny that God has for me with confidence, with hope, with joy, with celebration. Now, before I read the passage, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 2. We're going to be going through the whole chapter. So if you have your Bibles, turn there because we're going to get ready to read it. It's a beautiful narrative of how we see this young girl, Ruth, who's able to move past her past. And she's able to recognize that God is greater than her past. And I believe that this morning there are some of you, you're holding on to your past because you love your parents too much. You're holding on to your past because you love your family history and you do not know how to get past your past without being insulting to them. Without coming across like you don't love your parents. You see, you don't want to carry the trauma of your parents' drama. And so what you do is you, you want to be loving and so you just participate in the trauma just so that you could still be a good child to your parents. And this morning, God is going to do such gentle surgery, gentle surgery, oh, such beautiful surgery for you to be able to recognize the future that God has for you, the destiny, the purpose, the blessing, and how you move past your past because God is greater than your past. Now, for some of you, you're older and you have children that have um, hurt you. You have children that don't understand you, and um, you pray for them, and you feel stuck in this middle space of not knowing, how do I move forward now? What do, what do I do? Practical. I, I need something practical. Well, this message is for you, all right? So I believe this message is going to cover everybody, no matter where you are, okay? It could be family troubles. It could be relational troubles. It could be just personal struggles, it could be a situation in your life where you feel like, I've been in limbo for far too long. I've been in the waiting room for too long. And I believe that God's going to speak to you very clearly. And one more thing before we read, I believe that um, if there's someone who's coming over here who's sick and you've been praying for healing, I believe this morning God wants to heal you while the word is going out. And I'm saying that in faith right now. Um, and with how much the enemy has been tormenting me, I believe that he... He really does not want this word to go out, but God is greater, God is stronger. And I believe that this morning, God wants to help you get past your past. I believe that there's someone over here who has a sickness that's on you because you're holding on to the traumas from the past. And um, the human body is so fearfully and wonderfully made that it shows itself in various different ways. Uh, if God reveals to me, what the sickness is, I will say it while I'm, while I'm preaching. But for now, let's stand and let's read the Word of God uh, before we get too deep into this. So Ruth chapter 2, uh, from verse 1 to 23, this is a, a, a full narrative of what's going to happen as Ruth spends her first day in Bethlehem. Are you ready, church? Yes. Amen. Let's read. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So 
she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to a people that you do not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at meantime, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some leftover. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. Very good. Verse 15, we're almost there, all right? When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some of the, from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. She told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to his, her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Blessed uh, beside he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young woman, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. And that is chapter 2. Um, Ruth is... This is her first day in Bethlehem. She's come from Moab, and she's a foreigner. She's a Gentile. She's not supposed to be someone who's accepted in Bethlehem, in Israel. And she goes out, and we see what it's like when a person has come under the covering of the true and the living God. They're able to move past their past. And uh, the three things we're going to be unpacking is the action the attitude, and the answer. The action, what we do, the attitude, the way we respond, our emotions, our intellect, our disposition of our spirit, and then the response that comes from God. Let's pray. Father, grace, all-sufficient grace, we need it today, Lord. Father, your word can only be taught by you. Man cannot interpret your word. Interpretation of your word has to come through the Holy Spirit. 
So, Lord, this morning I pray for an outpouring of your spirit, O oh Lord. Your spirit that will teach us, that will strengthen us, that will heal us, that will forgive us and reconcile us to you, Lord. Enable us now to take action with the right attitude and then wait patiently for the answers we're waiting for. Let us receive, let's respond, and let's wait patiently. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. I pray for hearts that are ready to receive. Create a hunger in us, O oh Lord. And we know that you don't leave us as beggars. If you put a hunger, you will also fill it. So, Lord, now, before we get into unpacking this, create a hunger in us, Lord. Even in me, O oh Lord, create a new hunger, Lord. Lead us, O oh Lord. Lead us. Holy Spirit, flip the script this morning and lead us. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated and get ready. It's going to be a party, man. All right, note takers, write this down. Number one, how do you get past your past? You got to take action towards grace. And that's the first thing we see, the action towards grace. Um, oftentimes, when we're trying to get past our past, now, <laughs> have you ever been in that place where you try to listen to a sermon and you just want to throw up? You're like, eh, uh, I'm not being prideful. I, I promise you, I'm not being prideful. But this week, I mean, last night, I couldn't sleep a wink. So I'm trying to listen to stuff. I'm listening to an audiobook, And at four in the morning, I'm, I'm watching car reviews, hoping that it'll be boring enough to put me to sleep. And I'm wide awake and my alarm goes off and I was like, I don't need the alarm. I'll just get up and get ready and come to church and I'll sleep talk over here. But that's not what's happening. But how many times you, you want to move past, you want to move into something new, you want to move in the Holy Spirit, but it just feels dry, it just feels old and, and nothing really wakes you up. And many times what we want to do when we want to get past the past that's holding us down, we will run towards friends, we'll run towards food, we'll run towards programs, we'll run towards a book, we'll run towards sermons, we'll run towards preachers, we'll run to California, or Californians run over here. Or you run to this church where they claim to have revival or a great band or a great preacher. Um, I mean, nothing inherently wrong with that. But that's not something that's going to set you free from what's holding you back. You have to take steps towards grace. What do you do when you're faced with, you ever been in a situation? See, everybody has situations in their life, and it's all different. You know, when I was young, I had situations where the principal, and then I got a little older, I had situations with the girl I was going out with, her dad, Right? Nobody laughs for that. Okay, fine. And then I have situations with the cops. We all have those situations. You know what I'm talking about? Where it starts off small, but then you find yourself in a situation where you're like, oh my goodness, this is really going to cripple me for a long, long, long time. And those situations begin to build up. And when I was growing up, we called it baggage. We were like, that guy's got a lot of baggage. Don't go out with that girl, man. Baggage, right? Uh, we got to bring that back. But what do you do when that baggage keeps piling up and piling up and piling up and keeps holding you down? You see, the only way you get away from those baggages, the only way you get away from those cancerous habits that hold you down is you got to make a beeline towards grace. You got to make a beeline towards the favor of God. Naomi, last time where we left her off, she said, don't call me Naomi, which means sweet. She says, call me Mara, which means bitter. You see, Naomi seemed to have her life all together until there was a famine in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. And they leave Bethlehem, she, her husband, and her two children, and they go off to Moab, which is a God-forsaken place. God is not there. God is with the people of Israel. But the people of Israel were sinning, and they are facing a punishment from God. And instead of people repenting, they are running. And instead of returning, they are remaining. That was the first sermon that we heard in the book of Ruth. And Naomi comes back after her husband is dead, her two children are dead. How crazy is that? 
I mean, she has a lot of situations. And she's coming back to a whole new situation over here in Bethlehem. And people are like, is that Naomi? And she's like, don't call me Naomi. I'm Mara, I'm bitter. How is she going to get past her past? How is she going to get past her traumas, her heartbreaks? How is she going to get past the shame? Can you imagine the shame? Because when she left Bethlehem, probably she was like, suckers, there's food in Moab. See you later. Bye. And then my two sons, they're married now. Look at us. God is blessing us. But then, I mean, the first chapter, just those first six verses is depressing. It's like, bam, bam, bam. Elimelech dead. Two sons dead. And Naomi is working in the fields in Moab like a servant. And so she comes back. Doesn't seem very humble, but is very hurt for sure. But Ruth, on the other hand, is such a different contrast from Naomi. Look at Ruth over here. It is insane. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. We're going to get to Boaz in a little bit and more about him next week, all right? I don't want to get into it too much. That's coming up. Future attraction, quite literally for Ruth. All right, verse 2 says, And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, check this out, Let me go to the field and glean, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Okay, seems very simple when you read it the first time. Seems just like, okay, so Ruth's over here and she's like, Hey, we're in a new place and it's the harvest season. You're too old. How about I go get some food? In today's context, it's like, hey, listen, I'm going to take the car. I'll run onto Walmart and see what's there on discount. I'll go down to a food pantry and see what I could pick up. That's not what's happening. Look at the word over there. And in the book of Ruth, you got to pay attention when, whenever the word favor or grace is used because this whole book really is pointing towards how we are redeemed because of God's grace towards us. And it becomes a, a, a beautiful illustration. It says, in whose sight I shall find favor. Okay, I want you to listen to this, okay? Ruth is a brand spanking new believer. She is like, still smells like the brand new car, right? Like brand new, man. Brand new believer. First day in Bethlehem, she had just made a commitment. Naomi, your God is my God. And your people, my people, where you die, I will die. And where you're buried, I will be buried. She's making a covenant before God. And I'm so glad that this new believer, sometimes new believers have more faith than old, rusty believers. And she says, you know what? We're in Bethlehem. We heard, chapter one, they heard that God was blessing Bethlehem with food. And she says, we are in favor capital. We're in grace capital. I'm not going to sit on over here. I'm going to go looking for favor. Question for you. How many times do you get up in the morning and say, Lord, I'm ready to press into favor. I know you're a God who blesses. I know you're a God who's good. I know you're a God who's merciful. I know you're a God who's forgiving. I know you're a God who's generous. And I have come under your care and I am going to go seek favor. You see, when you don't get ready for God's grace, when you don't get ready for God's blessing, when you don't get ready for God's favor, you know what happens? You miss it. It's not that God doesn't bless you, but you will credit God's blessing to man or you just completely overlook it and you leave it by the wayside. Some of you, you probably don't understand this, but when you look at what's happened to your family, you overlooked your blessing you didn't realize how God was being favorable towards you, showing you grace, but because you say you believed in Jesus, you say that you're saved by grace through faith, but you weren't really preparing yourself for favor. You weren't really pressing in towards favor. You were pressing into getting a job, pressing into buying a house, pressing into your own health, pressing into make sure your children are well-educated in a good school, but nothing about the grace of God. And so your children now are well-educated in a good school, but I've fallen far from the grace of God. And you're wondering, where did I fail? Because, hey, if you really don't want to, if you want to break the cycle of the bad 
trauma, the bad habits being passed on from generation to generation to generation, you have to take action towards grace. You see, I don't like preaching messages that just sound great. I want to preach sermons that you can actually apply. And last week I was talking to a new friend of mine over here who said, isn't it crazy that these are things that the Bible so explicitly mentions, but we just overlook them so much. And this is one of those things we overlook. We get up, we come to church, but we don't come expecting to receive the grace of God, the favor of God. We are in favor capital and say, Lord, be favorable towards me. I'm so glad my mom, when I was little, every time I'd go to school, she would pray. She said, God, pray that Joel will find favor in the sight of his teachers and in, the, in, and in your sight. Because I needed that. I really needed favor inside of my principles, man, because I was seeing him every day. You know, we had a meeting at 12. Many times we forget that we have a God who favors us. Hey, child of God, I know your heart's breaking. I can sense it, man. And I wish I could hold each and every one of your hands and says, do you know that you have a God who favors you? <laughs> you have a God who favors you. Hey, your family members might not favor you. Your boss, your neighbors, your spouse might not. You might be a pain in the neck, but God would gladly hold your hand and show you his nail-scarred hand and say, I love you. I favor you. I want to be generous to you. I want to be kind to you. I want to bless you. But if you are sitting back at home like Naomi, stuck in the past, believing the lies, saying, I'm dried up, I'm old, I'm useless, what good can come from me? Because that's what Naomi says to the young girls when they want to come with her to Bethlehem. You will overlook the favor of God. And I know for a fact there are many of you over here, you have blessings waiting for you, but you've been overlooking them. Oftentimes, your own setbacks will hold you back. Don't let it hold you back any longer. Every morning you wake up, Take action towards favor. Because if you don't, you will not recognize it during the day. Now, when I talk about favor, I'm going to use the word grace and favor interchangeably because they, 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 the Hebrew word is used the same for both these different English words, favor and grace. It's kain, kain, kain. It's grace. Now, when I talk about grace, many times I get asked this question. I say, you talk about grace, but can you define it? And maybe that's you. You say, okay, I want to take action towards favor. I want to take action towards grace. But what is grace? Anybody have that question while I'm talking about grace? Nobody. So we'll just skip that part, okay? No, I'm kidding. We won't do that. I know you're listening. And that's why you don't want to raise your hand. Because you're all white. Like... <laughs> look, at, look at this. Look at this. We're going to ask the, answer the question, what is grace? So I want you to write this down. And if you didn't come prepared to take notes, I want you to write this down. Because in the end, I'm going to have you shout these things out. Because we're going to see how it's defined so beautifully in this chapter. And if you want to move past your traumas, past your past and get to the purpose and destiny that God has for you, you have to understand grace because the first step of you walking away from the trauma, walking away from the cancer, walking away from the dumpster fire that generations before you have left, does anybody want to do that? Break the generational curse and walk into what God has for you? It starts with this. It starts with you taking action towards the grace of God, the favor of God. But the question is, what is grace then, man? Now, mm, I can throw a bunch of books at you and be like, well, read these guys and um, you will just come out to be an intellectual idiot. I don't want intellectual idiots in my church. I want people who can actually experience the grace of God, not just know about it because knowledge will puff up, but love will build up. And I want you to love what God has for you. So what is grace? Thank you. Verse 3 of Ruth chapter 2. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she, check this out, and she happened to come. And she happened to come. Pause real quick. There are some things about the Bible that really grind my gears, man. And that is one of those. I was talking to my friend over here on Tuesday, I think it was, yeah. And I said, that, that one line, I read it that morning and I want to punch the wall, you know. I'm like, there's no such thing as happenstance in the economy of God. Oh, she stumbled upon it and she, oh, yeah, somehow. And, <clears throat> it irritates me when Christians talk that way, you know. 
oh, I'm just so lucky. Thank my lucky stars. It's like, I want to go like, whack, you know? <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? Let me baptize you next time. Hold you down for a few minutes. <laughs> I'm joking. I won't do that. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Okay, I want you to know this, that grace is not happenstance. Oh, Lord. Grace is a gift that's given to you. It's a gift given to you. No, 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 no. I want you to get this. You don't just stumble into it. Someone invited you to this church and they've been long offended and gone, but you're still here. You didn't just stumble into this. No, 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 no. It's the grace of God. <clears throat> Many people live the lifestyle that you lived and they're dead and gone. You're not like, oh, thank God. Fingers crossed, touch wood, whatever nonsense you say over here in this country that means that somehow you're lucky to hell with all of that, man. It's the grace of God. Give credit where credit's due. Grace is a gift that God gives you, not happenstance. I want you to take inventory of your life, count your blessings, name them one by one and say, the grace of God, take action towards grace. How in the world do you get past your past? Because you got to know that, yes, Satan intended to harm you, but the grace of God turned it for his glory, which is your greatest good. Count your blessings, name them one by one until it surprises you what the Lord has done. Grace is a gift. Are you writing it down? We're going to go, go through five different scriptures because I really want you to get this this morning. And if you have to stop after point one, we'll do it. It's fine. But what is the grace of God? The grace of God is a gift. The grace of God is a gift. Many of you, you're burnt out in your life you're tired, you're depressed, you're weary, you're grasping at every dark cloud you can find, hoping to find some rain and some solace because you've completely overlooked the grace of God. There's a lot of action in your life, but it's not towards grace. And we're going to get into that a little bit more in a little bit over here of how your actions can show that you're not really taking action towards grace, but it's towards these other things and we'll confront them. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. I want you to write this down. So first, grace is a gift and here's scripture to go with it in case you're like, well, this guy's just making stuff up. Well, you're making stuff up. Okay, Ephesians 2, 8, I'm kidding. For by grace, you've been saved. How? By grace, you've been saved through faith. That's correct. And it's not your own doing. That, 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 is, that is, you didn't work for it. You didn't go cut your hair and stitch up your ripped jeans and come to church and God's like, I kind of like this guy. I could do something with him. No, it's not your own doing. It's not because you went to Bible college. It's not because you read your Bible this morning. Or it's not because you went and bought a bigger Bible than the pastor has. It's not your own doing. It is the the gift of God. It's the gift of God. You ever received a gift? It's got your name on it. This has got your name on it. What is grace? It's a gift of God. Do you earn it, church? Yes. Do you earn it? Yes. You don't earn it. You cannot earn it. You cannot earn it. But can you receive it? Yes. yes. We all should. And it says, it's not a result of works that no one may boast. So how do you get past your past? Well, you see, you got to take action towards grace. Ruth doesn't sit down and say, man, woe is me. I'm a foreigner in this place. If I go out, I'm going to be assaulted, which we're going to see. There's a warning over there. If I go out, no one's going to like me. They're going to know that I'm a Moabite. We're the enemies of the Israelites. But what she does is she's taking action towards grace. And we see in the Bible spelled out for us that grace is a gift, and we're going to see it illustrated by the end of this chapter. Number two, we see that grace justifies us. Grace justifies us. Don't get frightened by words like these. See, justification is where you are welcomed back again. You're reconciled. The greatest problem with man is we're disconnected from your creator. You're, dis you're unplugged. You have no power. 
yeah, it is an iPhone 15, 16 Pro Max, you know, all the fancy things, but it's got no juice. It's got to be plugged in. Yeah, you got, you got all, the, all the right fittings, but you haven't got the power for you to actually be able to live out your destiny, live out your purpose. And what the grace of God does is it justifies you. It, it reconciles you with God again. Here, here's scripture, write this down under grace justifies us. It's Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Doesn't stop there. Verse 24 says, and are justified, how? By his grace, and once again, it says, as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So I want you to get excited about this because every single one has failed, the Bible says. So we don't need to act like we've not failed. Thank God. So you don't need to come to church like as if you walked on water all week long. Okay, you don't need to come to church like as if you just raised the dead. No, no, we can, we can put all that aside. Garbage, put it aside. The Bible says we all have sinned. But this is what gets us excited. We get excited because the grace of God justifies us. Not because of our works, but as a gift. It's been given to us freely. Okay, what is grace? The third thing we see that grace is, is it's all sufficient. It's all sufficient. Now, this is beautiful. Why is it so important that the first step in us getting past our past, God says you've got to take action towards grace because grace is a gift. Grace will justify you with God and grace is all sufficient. More than money, more than health, more than influence in the world, more than how many people know your name, you need grace. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, very familiar verse for many of you. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So he was being tormented. And three times he goes to the Lord. And God's reply to him was, my grace is sufficient for you. Why is that? For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, he says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I hope you sing the theme over here. You cannot earn it. You don't deserve it. It's given to you as a gift. And it's such a beautiful gift that it reconciles you with God. And it's so amazing that that's all you need. That's all you need. You need the grace of God. Why do you need the grace of God? Because it fulfills man's greatest need, which is reconciliation with God. Why is it mankind's greatest need, grace, that reconciles us with God? Because that's what helps us actually see who we are. Whether that you're blind. All right, number four, what is grace? Grace transforms us. So grace is a gift. Grace justifies us. Grace is all sufficient. And grace transforms us. Some of you, you've been Christians for 50 years. And the only transformation that you've seen is a religious kind of transformation. Oh, wow. You, you just know how to be arrogant. You know how to be judgmental. You know how to be critical. You know how to find fault. That's your spiritual gift. You sniff it out. You, you know how to criticize the preacher and his um, bad use of Greek and Hebrew. But the grace of God has not transformed you. <laughs> Sorry, I know I'm being funny, but it's truthful too. Um, yeah, you've never really smiled in joy because the Holy Ghost has, has infilled you. The, the Word of God says the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And you've never seen your face with joy <laughs> in a long, 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 long time. And what you need for you to get past your past is you need to take action towards the grace of God because the grace of God will, is a gift it's, it's, it's offered to you for free. It'll justify you. It's all sufficient and it transforms you. Okay, let's look at scripture for that. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know what the grace of God does? The grace of God tells you not to be a jerk. I mean, my translation of it. The grace of God will say, hey, chill out, man. The grace of God says, 
Do you really want to be mean to that person? Don't you remember how much I've forgiven you? Shouldn't you be gracious? And you're like, yeah, Lord, you're right. And it transforms you. One of the best compliments I've gotten as a Christian was two years ago, three years, two years ago, yeah. And it took me so long, man, like more than two decades of being a believer to finally be complimented that I'm a Christian. I'm not joking, I'm true about this. This is a real story. When my older brother in India calls my dad who's in Canada and says, you won't believe it, Joel is a different guy. Ever since he gave his life to Christ, it's, it's stuck. And you know how happy I was to hear that from my older brother where he and I used to smoke pot together and we got into so much trouble together and uh, uh, he joins me sometimes online. If he's listening to this, I'm sure he's laughing his guts off. And um, when I gave my life to Christ, I was the runaway. And uh, after about two years of being away, I saw Josh and my parents did not know where I was. I saw Josh walking on the road, blown out of his mind. He had no idea where he was. He had a guitar in his hand and piercings all over his face and long hair. And not that I'm against it, but he just looked that part, you know? I sound like a Baptist guy, you know? His long hair and his piercings. And I laid my hand on him and said, no, I'm kidding. No. And I was like, Josh. And he came over and um, within, within a month, it was crazy how Josh saw a difference in my life and he was compelled to surrender his life to Jesus. One evening, he left home, and every evening he would go and hang out with his friends and do stuff. And I would, every time he went out, I would go to the rooftop, and I would start to pray. Not for him, but I just enjoyed solitude time in prayer. And one evening, I saw him go out, and five minutes later, he was back, and he came upstairs, and he says, I cannot ignore this any longer. And he said, you got to pray for me. And I put my hand on him, and he leaped about 10 feet. It was crazy. The power of God was amazing in that place. And we sat and we prayed all night that night. Ladies and gentlemen, the grace of God will transform you. The grace of God changes you from being having a critical spirit to having a gentle spirit, from being a bitter person to being quick to forgive. All right. The, the grace of God transforms. So what have you seen so far? First of all, grace is a... Thank you. And grace justifies us. And then grace is all sufficient. And grace transforms us. Now, now here's, here's a catch, all right? Number five. God gives the gift of grace only to the humble. I should have underlined only. Only to the humble. Only to the humble. You know why? Because if you're prideful, there is no room for you to receive the grace of God. If you're prideful, you're saying, I don't need the gift of grace, I got it. And there are many people who feel like, I got this, I don't need God. We all have friends like this. Whenever you share the gospel, they're like, yeah, bro, I think you need it, but I don't need it. I, I have it all together. My marriage is fine, my job is fine, my health is fine, my children are fine, my eternal destiny is fine, I don't care about it. Yeah, they're not going to have the grace of God. They won't recognize the grace of God. The grace of God is a gift that God gives, but it's only for the humble. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what should you do? Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. All right. So we're talking about Ruth. In the book of Ruth, we've gone, we've gone on a tour all throughout the New Testament talking about the grace of God. Let's go over those five things real quick because the first action towards you getting past your past, the first action towards you being set free from the demonic influences from the past that God has saved you from is you got to take action towards the grace of God. And the grace of God, number one, it's a gift. Number two, it justifies you. You can raise your voice, it's fine. I'm not gonna be offended, all right? Number three, grace is all sufficient. Number four, grace transforms us. But number five, God gives the gift of grace only to the... Very good. Now, that is, that's the action we take, all right? So the action we take is not, we, we don't run towards doctors, medicine. Not that that's bad. Don't get me wrong. We, we're not trying to find hope in food. We're not trying to find hope in our funds, in our election results, or whatever it is. We first want to run to the grace of God. That's our action. That's our immediate plan of action is, I need the grace of God. Now, 
you also need to have the right attitude when God begins to gift you with the fruits of grace. That's number two, the attitude towards grace. The attitude towards grace. I know this is not a very typical sermon that you would hear, and I say that every single week, don't I? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but man, I'm telling you, I really don't need my notes this morning to preach because I'm talking from what I've seen God do in my life, and I'm so excited for God to do it in your life too. The attitude towards grace. Now, I've seen people who are crying at the altar, weeping for God to do a miraculous shift, a turn, a transformation in their life, and I'm praying with them, and I'm staying up, and I'm like, man, I, I'm dedicated to God meeting you, and I'm, we're, we're going to get through this. And what happens? God comes through. Praise the Lord, right? And in two weeks, what's happened to that person? The attitude changes. You know those people where when they're down, oh, they got this humility and they're like, oh, brother, I'm so broken. Oh, pastor, I'm dying. Oh, pastor, please pray for me. And man, I, I'm just really going to walk with God and I'm, I'm so grateful for everything that God is doing and thankful for you and all that stuff. And they get a pay raise. Small little pay raise. Oh, my goodness. Gone. They're living in a whole different planet altogether. The emails and texts they send is, oh, no, this is a true story. And now they start telling me how to preach and how to pray and what I should do. And I'm like, hey, man, hey, hey wait, 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 slow, slow down, slow down, slow down. Didn't God just get you through this? What happened? Why have you grown so tall in your own brains? Grown so tall in your own attitude. Aye, you got to watch out. How many of you, you were down and you cried out to God and God helped you and instead of you remaining humble, you became an arrogant person. You became prideful. The best way to put this is, the best way to put this is, you were in kindergarten, you were in kindergarten and then you graduated to first grade and so you go beat up everybody in kindergarten. Oh, how idiots, children. Oh, come on. You don't even know what's one plus one. You're an idiot. Ah, slow down, man. Sorry. Nobody's sitting over here this week because of last week. <laughs> slow down. No, many of you are like this. You came with a humble spirit. Oh, nobody wanted to receive you, but... But God received you and he showed you grace. And instead of you extending grace, that humility has become self-righteousness. Your, your, your attitude has become arrogant. And you're vicious now. And, and the worst part is you, you're one of those religious vicious people who has a testimony. Oh my goodness, those are the worst kind. Well, oh, I know, I know everything about living on the street and being a drug addict and how God saved me. I'm like, but bro, there's no grace in you, man. You don't do drugs anymore, but you're, you're a jerk. Where's the grace of God? Okay, your attitude towards grace. Verse 4, Ruth chapter 2. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you, and they answered, the Lord bless you. Like I said earlier, we'll get into uh, Boaz and his character in a bit, but I want to focus on Ruth. Verse 5. Then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? Now, I want you to know something, okay? I kind of had fun researching this a little bit. <clears throat> there are three things over here about Boaz that, that we, we see over here that, that helps us understand Ruth's attitude towards grace. So number one, Boaz's question tells us that Boaz has never met Ruth before. He doesn't know who Ruth is. Um, he's heard about Ruth and Naomi coming back like we're going to see, but he's never met them, all right? Tan, 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 he's curious. He assumes that she's a servant girl that one of his laborers have brought to work. So he's assuming something, but this is the best part. When he says, whose young woman is this? Uh, I try to find a modern day equivalent of this word. Uh, it could be, and who's that baby doll? It's, it's, you see, it's not, just, it's not just like, who's that girl? But he's like, who's that young girl? Mm. <laughs> you know? All right, Lord, forgive me if I'm wrong with that. But the Hebrew word over there seems like that's what he's talking about. <clears throat> All right. And the question I asked myself when I saw this was, how is Ruth's attitude going to change 
when the boss man who's wealthy shows up and takes notice of her? Is she going to turn into a person who's a gold digger? You know, a person who's arrogant now, a person who's going to maybe play a victim card? Well, let's look at this. Verse 6, And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She's a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. How beautiful is that? So she's come in to the field, and I want you to read between the lines over here, or slow down and just read the lines even. She's come over there, and... Every time I go through this, I have to stress, she said, please. Arrogant people don't say please. You know you're a prideful person when you don't say thank you. Evaluate your own life. Even when you go to a restaurant, if you want more water, say please. And when they give you water, say thank you and mean it. Not like, thank you. You know, something that we teach our children, sadly, is say thank you, say thank you. And what do they do? Thank you. Hey, that's not gratitude. You're just teaching your kid to be a very good hypocrite. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. No, he's not grateful at all. He's just singing because you'll trust his ear if you don't hear him sing. At least in Indian churches, not over here, right? They'll call CPS on you. He twisted my ear. But <laughs> Ruth, sorry, I'm getting distracted. But Ruth over here, it's very interesting that she comes and she works. She comes and she works. She left home with an action towards favor. And now her attitude is, God has put a blessing in front of me. I'll focus on that. I, wanna, I, wanna, I know a lot of sub-points this morning. Three principles from Ruth's attitude that we need to have. Three principles from Ruth's attitude that we need to have if we are going to embrace the blessing that God has for us and put the past behind. Thank you, Lord. Are you ready, church? Yes. Okay, don't get distracted, all right? The first principle that we see, Ruth is prepared for favor. We saw this earlier, but you cannot miss this principle that we need to apply if we are going to walk in freedom and not keep being dragged back to the hell that God has saved you from. you got to be prepared for favor. And you might want to write this down too. Ask yourself, are you anticipating miracles in your life? Are you expecting God to show up in a supernatural way? Or are you just waiting for Sunday to come so you can come to church and feel like you've done your religious duties? No, I mean this. Whenever trouble hits, whenever trauma comes, whenever the past comes back knocking on your door, whenever the dark clouds begin to surround you, are you preparing yourself for the favor of God because our God is rich in mercy, abounding in steadfast love? Ruth chapter 2, verse 2, let me take you back again. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. She's got one thing on her mind more than food, it's the favor of God. She says, I'm going to go out in faith because I know that God is a God who's giving us favor. And I've come under his care. And it's almost like she doesn't even doubt. Isn't it awesome to have faith like that? To say, God, I'm not going to doubt this, Lord. Your word says it. I believe it. I'm going to walk in it. The first principle that we see, if you want to have the right attitude of walking in grace, prepare yourself for favor. Number two, we see that she's not a people pleaser. Oh my goodness, I might camp out on this for a little bit, okay? Do not be a people pleaser. Let me go to the field, she says, and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. Now we saw in verse 7, she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for short rest. I mean this when I say this, and I'm very sorry if I personally offend you with this, but I'm saying this because we need to be set free. I want to talk to two generations over here, the younger generation and the older generation. And if you're like me in the middle, this both is for you, and I think we're the worst of all, I think. The 25-year-olds the like me? <laughs> Don't laugh. Come on. No. You see, the younger generation... We're so used to medals being handed out for nothing. Yeah. Hey, stop, stop. No, no, no. This is why you don't say amen. No, no, no. We're not trying to insult them. Yeah, you're right. I'm getting to you. Okay, hold on. 
then young people get ready to say yeah the same way they said yeah, okay? Now, now younger generation was so used to people coming up to you and be like, wow, that's so great. Man, you're so talented. Wow, did you do that all by yourself? It's because you're old and you don't know how to handle a cell phone, but these young people, that's what they grew up with. They could do it in their sleep. And so we're like, wow, that's so great. You took a picture all by yourself. Dude was born with a cell phone in his hand, okay? But because we encourage them so much over stupid things, we've gotten so predisposed to, are people seeing me? Are people appreciating me? How many likes did I get? How many, people, how many people are following me on Instagram? How many people are on my TikTok? I want to be a social media influencer so I can just live off of social media money. Young people, stop being a stupid people pleaser. Because when you're pleasing people, you don't have the attitude that you need to have for you to walk in grace. Because you start walking in pride. You start walking in arrogance and you say, grace of God, I'll put it aside. I want the favor of man. Now let's go to the older generation. Are you ready? Sleep belts on, deep breath in, deep breath out. You're going to feel a slight pinch, a little pressure, but it'll be all right. Older generation, we can get very arrogant because of our age and our experience. And we say, I know this. Who is this young buck trying to teach me about the grace of God? You know how many times I've heard the sermon of Ruth and... So many other great preachers, good for you, man. But the question I want to ask you is, has there been a transformation in your life or is it just information overload? You see, many times we get so caught in our pride that our attitude of grace is not even close in the vicinity of the life that you're living. You could say that you have experience and you have age, but you can have a very rotten attitude and everything you say about your grace means nothing. Now, I want to make this a little bit more personal and say, like I said earlier in our announcements, you come to this church with bad habits. And as soon as either I or the Word of God or the Spirit of God begins to convict you, you walk away. And I will tell you without a shadow of a doubt, it's because you've been a Christian for 50 years, but you got no root and you fake your fruit. Sure, you're not looking at man for encouragement because you do that for yourself. You're just prideful. You're just arrogant. You know exactly how church should be done. You know exactly how a Christian life should be lived. And you are not going to budge even if Jesus were to come in flesh and tell you you're being an idiot. Some of you, you know you're like this. And if you really want to let go of... Because you, you, know, you know why we do that? You know why we do that? It's because of trauma. It's because, bro, the shushing is actually louder than your child, man. I'm sorry. Yeah. And it happens at those parts where I'm feeling very sensitive about something. And the reason why you're unable to shift and change what God is calling you to do is because you're stuck in your past victories, man. You're stuck in past things. And I want you to know that Moab was great, I'm sure, for you. There was a lot of great things that happened. But God's brought you to Bethlehem. But God's brought you to a season of harvest. And God's brought you to a place where the fields are ripe. And if you don't want to change, you are going to be carrying that baggage of your past and constantly going through this vicious cycle of pain. And I really don't want that for you. Now, does it mean that you're not saved? By no means, man. Of course you're saved. But you're forfeiting the blessing of God. You're forfeiting the joy. Now, I know personally that there are families broken apart because of an older generation that's not learned to yield to the Holy Spirit, to submit and to surrender. And please forgive me. I know I'm much younger than many of you. But I say this because I love you. And I'm saying this like I would tell my mom. Actually, with my mom, I'll be a little bit more forceful. But with you, I'm being gentle. And the question I want to ask you, is it possible that the people you're trying to please is your own religious pride? 
here's a good way for you to answer that question to see if you really are struggling with this. Are you recognizing the blessing in front of you or are you blind to it? I mean this. When was the last time? Both generations now. When was the last time? With tears in your eyes, or if you're not a person who doesn't cry, with that joyful heart, you genuinely were able to fall at the feet of Jesus and say, thank you. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll move away from this point after saying this. Pseudo-humility gets really upset when it's not recognized. Okay? So if you're upset at home when people don't recognize what you're doing, you're a people pleaser. If you come to church and I don't recognize your gift, your calling, and you get really upset, you're a people pleaser. And if that's you, I really need you to be there at our leadership equipping that's happening this Friday, Megan, this Friday, because I want to talk a little bit more about this. And I believe this morning God wants to save you from this, man. And God wants to give you a spirit of humility so you can actually walk in the grace of God, putting the past behind you. The third principle we learn from Ruth's attitude towards favor is Praise God in your work. Praise God in your work. How does this work? How do we see this in the book of Ruth? But in, in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22, it says, And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleaning after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So this is a command that God gave the people of Israel. He said, when you are reaping the harvest in your field, leave the stuff in the edges. If you drop, if you forget, let it go. Leave it there. Don't go pick it up. Why? Because it's going to be there for the poor. It's going to be there for the widows. And there are multiple verses in the Bible that says, leave it for people who need this. Isn't it great? This was God's plan to help people who couldn't afford a meal. He didn't say, go stand in a line and get a food box. He said, no, I want to give you the dignity of work. So go to the field, there's harvest over there, pick it, glean for yourself, and take care of yourself. And if you're able to glean plenty, go sell it in the marketplace. Isn't that great? Hey, you want a food box? Come sweep the church building, man. I'll go get you lunch. And what else do you need? No, I'm not kidding. That's not, I'm just, just an idea, all right? That's not what I want to do. I'm kidding. But there's got to be a way that people can have the dignity of work. Okay, how does this translate to Ruth's principle being praising God in a work? Listen to me. Ruth is getting out, recognizing the favor of God. We saw that. She's going out knowing that God is going to meet her as she gets out into the field. And somehow she knows that this is the law of the land. Track with me. She's from Moab. But somehow she knows that in this land, the God that she's come under, whose wings she's come under, is a God who favors the poor. And she's walking in the law that God has given that land. Do you know what this means for you and me? It means that when we work, we gotta work under the promises of God. Okay, this, this is what it looks like for me in my life and I don't know what it'll look like for you. That means for me, when I get up to get ready to preach this Sunday morning and I haven't slept a wink and I'm feeling tired in my spirit and the enemy's been after me, I want to walk in the promises of God I want my work to be praise and worship. And I'm doing it not because it's my duty. I'm not doing it because it's my job. I'm doing it because what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 is this. It says, for we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to His promise. You see, the Bible is full of blessings and promises that God has for us. But if our attitude is not right, we cannot walk in the attitude of praise as we live out our life. It says in the book of Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples teaching them everything I commanded you and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So when I feel like so dry and far away from God, I'm going, going to let my work be worship because I'm going to walk in faith even though I don't feel it. Sure, Ruth is a foreigner. She's a Moabite. She's 
could have played the victim card. She's putting herself in grave danger, but she's walking in this promise knowing that this is the law of God and I'm going to walk in faith because God will meet me when I stand on his word and when I go there. And fair enough, there are crops. There's, there's corn and barley that she's able to, she's about 50 pounds that she's able to get. Folks, I really want the rubber to meet the road in your life. Psalm chapter 53 has been one of my favorite chapters in the season of my life. 53 verse 3 says, David writes and he says, when I'm afraid, I will trust in the Lord. When I'm afraid, I will trust in the Lord. There's a lot of darkness in this season with a lot of demonic activity going around. And I've been holding on to it and saying, Psalm 53, 3, when I'm afraid, I will trust in the Lord. And you know what happens just a few verses down to verse 11? David says, because I trust in the Lord, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Oh man, that's good. He starts it by saying, hey, when I'm afraid, I will trust in the Lord. But as you begin to walk in the purpose and the promise of God, walking on what God's word says, like Ruth saying, I know that the law of the God says that in the field, I will be able to find, because I'm poor, I'm a widow, I can, this applies to me. Same way, I'm, Lord, I'm afraid, I'm going to trust in you. And by verse 11 says, because I trust in the Lord, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Folks, if you want to have the right attitude for grace, you've got to have your work reflect the praise towards God. Praise God in your work. Are you getting it? Yes. All right. And there are so many other verses, and I want you to write them down, man. Whatever verse it is for you that reminds you of the promises of God that gives you the courage to walk in faith. Keep on walking in it. This is not mantras that we recite, but it's promises of God that we hold fast to, that we hold true and say, Lord, I know that you're in this. Okay, verse 8. Then, Bo then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, and do not glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they're reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink when the young men have drawn. You see, I told you that it was dangerous for Ruth to go out as a Moabite. And that's why Boaz is saying, I I've charged the young men not to touch you. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, you talk about the grace and the favor of God for a person who's extremely vulnerable. Man, I hope this is giving you courage to step out in faith, knowing that God will meet you when, you when you begin to walk in obedience, when you begin to walk in truth, when you begin to walk in the promises of God, God will meet you there. Verse 10, then she fell on her face. Look at, look at Ruth's attitude, all right? Look at Ruth's attitude. Because after all of this, Ruth could have been like, well, thank you, but that field's got more grain, so I'm out of here. I don't like that fellow was looking at me. But look at Ruth. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, beautiful question, ladies, pay attention to this. Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? What a beautiful question. Man, I'm trying to teach my daughter to think this way. If some dude's being kind to you, why? You want to give me a ride back home? Why? You want to buy me dinner? Why? You want to compliment me? Why? You see, I hope you're getting this, man. I know we had some distractions over there, but let's come back. Let's come back. Grace of God is not frightened to be put to the test. Ruth is not frightened to say, hmm, I'll just take it and just shut up and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, master. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No. Why? You see the courage? How many of us live with this poverty mentality and we're like, don't even question it. Just tiptoe around it. Don't, 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 don't stir the nest. Don't just, just. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No, no, why? Why? And look at the word she used. Why have I found favor? Why have I found this grace? Don't forget, this is the thread that's running along throughout this chapter. She leaves home looking for favor. She finds favor. And now this guy is saying, hey, listen, favor upon favor, grace upon grace, have it all. And she's like, wait a minute, but why? Ruth is not being stupid over here. Look at Boaz's answer. Look at Boaz's answer. It's beautiful. But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and come to a people that you did not know before. Okay, pause, 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 pause. Doesn't this sound a little like Boaz is repaying her for what she's done? 
hey, you did this, so I'm doing this. Doesn't it sound that way? The answer is yes, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> because, because as of now, it looks like all that you have done for your mother-in-law, you left your father's house, you made such a big sacrifice, and so, oh, this is the least I could do. Now, earlier I told you the first thing that grace is a, uh, is it a gift or a payment? Because it seems like it's a payment, seems like it's paying back for what you did. I hope, I hope I'm preaching to a church that wants to grow this morning. So track with me. I know, I know, I know it's, it's getting long. Is grace a gift or is it a payment? Many times we think it's a, it's a payment. It's like, no, if, if I do this, then God will do this. If I do, and Proverbs chapter 16, we're going to wrestle with this a lot. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Okay, look at verse 12 and it makes more sense. Then Boaz continues to say, the Lord repay you for what you have done. Who repay you? The Lord repay you. Now he's saying, I recognize what you have done, but I'm doing this because I want the Lord to repay you for what you have done. And a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. You see, the highlight of this is not Ruth. You left your family, Ruth. Boaz is so excited that this Moabite woman has this radical transformation, this metamorphosis, where she's come under the wings of the Almighty God. And he says, welcome to grace. This is what grace is. Although you're a Moabite, and in fact, in the Bible, it says, no Moabite will enter into the temple to worship until the 10th generation. Some scholars believe that Ruth is the 10th generation. I don't know about that. And he says, no, this is what grace looks like. When you come under the wings of God, man, you're going to be running into favor. That is, if you're taking action towards favor, and if your attitude is towards favor, this is what God does. Because Boaz is a man who honors God, he's recognizing the favor of God. This is God's favor given to Ruth because she has come under his wings. I want you to, I want you to remember this, and I want you to apply this to your life. God will use people to show you grace. Okay? God will use people to show you grace, but it doesn't mean you become a people pleaser. Neither should you be arrogant towards people. Okay? Ruth, when she asks why she's not being arrogant, I mean, she did say please. When she asks why, she's really trying to understand. She's a new believer, man. She's like, wait, why are you being so kind to me? And I hope that when you're kind to people, I hope you're able to bring them under the wings of the Almighty and say, hey, I'm not doing this because I'm a Christian. I'm not doing this because I'm a good person. I'm doing this because I'm under the wings of the Almighty and God's provided for me. And I want you to know the grace of God that's rich towards you. Verse 13, we'll move on fast. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes. Look at that. I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord. Now, when she says, Lord, she's not calling him God. It's like, sir, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I'm not one of your servants. Do you see humility there? Do you see the attitude of grace over there? She's not being arrogant about saying, hey, you know what? I'm just going to thank you very much, but no thanks. All right, very quickly, number three, the answer of favor. We're going to go through this really fast, okay? The answer of favor. We're going to see the five things that we saw grace is being illustrated in Boaz's action. The answer of favor. Let's go. We're going to finish this in 10 minutes. Time me. Verse 14, and at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some leftover. Okay, you know what's a great way to sum these few verses up? Gift. She's gifted with lunch. She didn't pay for it. She's brought, although she's an outsider, she's brought, come here, eat some bread, dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and look at this. He passed to her roasted grain. And she said, sorry, I'm not doing carbs right now. I'm on this keto diet. She didn't do that. And she ate till she was satisfied. And she had some leftover. I want you to get the picture of God's grace. It's a gift. All right, verse 15. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, let her glean even, even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. What's the second thing we learned about grace? It justifies you. 
It reconciles you. Look at her. She's a foreigner over here. And Boaz, the master, is telling everybody else, do not rebuke her. I wonder how many of you feel like you're being rebuked by God. But when you come under the grace of God, there is therefore no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You've been justified by God. There is no more rebuke. There is no more punishment. There is no more condemnation. Why? Because the grace of God justifies you. You're seated at his table, participating in the bread and the wine like we're going to be doing in just a few minutes. All right, moving on real quick. She gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned. Not some young guy. She's like, whack him. Stop looking at me that way. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley, about 50 pounds, I told you. And she took it up and went to the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. How awesome is that? One day, 50 pounds of barley and leftover food. What's the third thing we learned about grace? All sufficient. It's all sufficient. Look at it being illustrated over here. It's more than enough. Oh, it's more than enough. Overthinkers. I want you to know the grace of God is more than enough. Who cares what man thinks of you? The grace of God is more than enough. Stop being a people pleaser. The grace of God is more than sufficient. Naomi sitting at home saying, I am Mara. And here comes grace. And what does grace do next? transforms you. Look at this. Look at the transformation. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Mother-in-laws, why do you ask so many questions? Back off. I'm kidding. <laughs> Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, this, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, oh my, my. No. May he be blessed by the Lord, <laughs> whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours and is one of our redeemers. Now we're going to see the, the theme of the last chapter is going to be the redeemer, which transforms Ruth's life. The transformation is so crazy that it's a Moabite woman who's a widow who ends up in the genealogy of King David and not just King David, but in the genealogy of Jesus. You talk about a transformation. I want you to know as I bring this message to a close, I don't care what your past was. God is greater than your past. And he's called you out of Moab, but don't be like Naomi sitting at home saying, woe is me, life is bitter. Hey, take action towards favor, have the attitude towards favor, apply the principles that we see in God's word, and watch the grace of God, the gift that you receive that justifies you, that reconciles you with God, that is all sufficient, that begins to transform you. And then look at the humility, verse 21. And Ruth the Moabite said, besides, he said to me, you shall keep close by my young men until you have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman, lest in another field you get assaulted. I told you, it was dangerous out there. Now, daughter-in-laws, what do you do when your mother-in-law tells you to do something? Whatever. You're not my mom. What do you know? Times are different now. Oh, no, I really trust Boaz. I think he's going to be great. Okay. But look, sorry. I've heard this as a youth pastor, man. It's like, no, he's a great guy. He loves Jesus. Just because he raised his hand in worship doesn't mean... No, I'm not going to go there. Verse 23. So I told you 10 minutes. So she kept close to the young woman of Boaz. Look at her humility. She kept close. She listened to her mother-in-law. She listens to Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. All right. Did you guys learn something? Yeah. Good. Let's stand. Let's pray. I'm not going to drag this out. If you got it, you got it. If you didn't, you didn't. You're getting your money's worth. I've seen the tithing. I'm joking. I don't. <laughs> what has happened to this church? <clears throat> Was that okay, Megan? Was that funny? Yeah? Okay. Just want to make sure I'll be fed when I get back home. Hey, I'm so glad to hear laughter. Sometimes we take ourselves so seriously and you begin to worship what man thinks of you. I hope I'm able to be an illustration of just chilling out, man. Relax. We'll take God seriously. Who cares what man thinks of you? The grace of God this morning I believe is a gift that God wants to freely give any single person over here that says, Lord, I'm struggling, Lord. There are attitudes that have crept into my life that I'm unable to break free from. 
I care too much about what people think of me. I'm too scared about what you think of me. And I'm really worried that one day my past is going to come back to haunt me. I want us to put to death today all of those fears. If you want to imagine like a coffin that you're throwing it all in, we're nailing it, and we're going to bury it this morning. And I want us to really take action towards grace, have the right attitude of humility that God requires from us to say, Lord, constantly, Lord, I just want to be right with you. What can man do to me? And then, like everything we see illustrated with Boaz and Ruth, I believe that God wants to bless you. I believe that God has blessings for every single one of you. We have not a prosperity gospel preacher, but I know that God, his plan is not for you to live a life separated from joy, separated from the Spirit of God, separated from life that God has for you. So I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to go out there and have communion in just a little bit, and uh, I'll pronounce the benediction over there. But for now, Father, I pray for every single heart that needs a touch from you, O Lord. Lord, please, Lord, help America understand what church really is and help me to lead this church well. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Forgive us, Lord, for trying to put you into a time frame. Forgive us, Lord. No, that's not what you want the living church to be like. Huh. Yeah. I know that when I said <clears throat> you get a pay raise and your attitude changes, I know you're in this room. It's not someone online, or maybe you're online too. And I, the Holy Spirit's calling you to repent. Um, I want to, we, a few weeks ago we said, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. And this is an area where I, I'm, I'm warning you, this is what God constantly does when we don't turn even after he clearly speaks to you, um, you will go back through that same old cycle and it gets worse and worse and worse every time. Don't be a believer that has the great leaves but no root. Please, I beg you this morning, repent. Um, and I, I want to challenge the older generation that <clears throat> you found yourself growing in the cancer of a critical spirit. And this morning, God's asking you to trade the critical spirit for a spirit of grace. But you can only come to that place with humility. And so, not because of this man over here, but uh, look past me, please, and, and just look to Jesus and talk to him and say, Lord, that's me, Lord. I, I have a critical spirit. And I'm, I'm really concerned about how, why people don't look at my hard work, and, and that's my pride. So please help me, Lord. Um, some of you, you, you think you're socially awkward. You're not. You're just prideful. And, and that's why you come across as harsh and rude and you're unable to get along with people. And what you need is for you to have the attitude of humility to be able to embrace grace. Father, I believe that you're answering prayers this morning, Lord. And for the bodies that are sick, I pray for healing. I pray special healing over our brother Marcus. I thank you, Lord, that that man does not need a man's hand to be placed on him for him to be healed. Uh, just your Holy Spirit is enough. And I know that your Holy Spirit's already there moving. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for putting our nasty paws in the middle of what you want to do and getting in the way. Lord, I pray that you'd give me the courage, Lord, to continue to lead this church the way you want it to be led, and then raise up disciples over here that'll gladly be willing to be crucified upside down like your disciple, Peter, with joy and laughter, <laughs> knowing that we're going to see the king soon and very soon. And in the meantime, oh Lord, help us to get away from the past sins that so easily entangle us, and help us to fix our eyes on you, the author, perfecter of our faith who for the joy endured the cross. I thank you, Jesus, for doing that. And as we get ready now to go participate in Holy Communion, break down the walls that are hindering the move of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And let's come alive, Lord. Let's come alive like we're supposed to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to go over there again.